What we're looking at now is Greek word studies. Follow along in your handouts if it's helpful. If not, then just watch the screen and watch me. Now, Greek word studies is when you look up a word in the Greek language in the New Testament and you try and learn more information about what this word means. You're very limited if you try and do word studies in English. It's very hard to do, as we see later on. Uh, especially we get words like thelipsis, the word for tribulation. Uh, it's translated all kinds of different ways in the Bible. Some people think tribulation, whoa, some weird word. You see it loads of times about distress and affliction. Very interesting seeing where it's used in Thessalonians. Very interesting. If any of you got my Revelation teaching, you, you see that. Um, but this is stuff you see in the Greek that it's very hard to see in English, but there's rules to doing it. Okay, and we've all got to show a bit of humility now because we're probably all going to start seeing stuff that we do that we shouldn't do. And it's a process for all of us. The stuff that I'm showing you guys is stuff that I've come across myself where I've been like, oh, I shouldn't be doing it this way. I'm, I'm not doing it accurately, but we all want to be handling the word of God correctly. So there's nothing wrong with thinking, ah, oh, this is, I, I do it this way though, and he's saying it's wrong. What I'm showing you is the kind of general guidelines that um, evangelical Greek scholars give people in how to do word studies. So rules of word searches. To start off with, first thing you've got to do is find the word to look up. Now, you might find that's a bit of a funny thing to say, but there is actually a, an art in finding the right word to look up. If you're teaching on 17 verses of Matthew, you're not going to do a word study on every single verse um, because you're not going to have an, uh, on every single word because then you're not going to have enough time. You're going to run out of time. What you do is you look in a verse and you say, what is the key word here? And quite often you'll be looking for like um, repeated words um, key or words where without that word, the verse loses its meaning. I think we covered that a bit on the scripture sculpture method. Um, you, you, or yeah, a word where you're like, if we took this out, the verse would take on a whole new meaning or it would completely lose its meaning. So I want to look up this verse or... John's used this word about five times in the last 10 verses. So I'm going to look it up, see what it means. So you're not looking up every word, you're looking up key words. When you've done that, the next thing is to find the semantic range. Now, you're all going to do this process in a minute. So don't worry if it's not sinking in quite at the moment. The semantic range means all the different ways that word is used. Okay, someone tell me in English, what does the word run mean? To run quickly, okay, like in sport, to move quickly. To move quickly. Or it could be running water. Okay, well, I'll tell you something. George Bush ran for president. Was he doing any running? Okay, um, the other day I ran Shay down to the shop. Was I, was I running? You know, and I, I let the water run for a while earlier, but the water weren't really going off on a jog. So what we're looking at there is the semantic range of the word run. It has many different meanings. So when you're doing a Greek word study, after you've found the word you want to study, the next thing is what is its semantic range? What are all the different ways that this word is used? Very important that. Um, next thing is that you compare the semantic range to the context. Okay. Very important. A lot of people stop. They look at the semantic range and they say, my sermon would be banging if I picked this one meaning here. I'm going to pick that meaning and I'm going to have a bad boy sermon. All right? Now, that's just not the right way to do it. That is putting stuff into the text rather than mining out of the text. So what we do, we look at the semantic range, then we look at the context and we say, okay, what is the meaning of this word here? So when I say the word run, you assumed it meant jogging. But then I gave you different contexts where it means a different thing. So once you know the semantic range, you look at the context, compare it with the semantic range. Next thing, check a commentary. What I'm trying to help you guys do is not to argue with commentaries, but to understand commentaries and to see what commentaries are saying. A lot of the really good commentaries are ones that a lot of it is written in Greek and they talk about Greek grammar a lot. I've brought along an example of one over there from the word biblical commentary from a guy called Donald Hagner. And if you have a look at it, when you've got some free time, you'll be like, oh, I didn't know commentaries did this. 
It's a whole new level. And by knowing a bit of Greek, you'll understand what these guys are chatting about. You'll be able to read the letters they use when they quote scripture. And you'll also get an understanding of the grammatical terms that they use. Um, you'll probably find you're not going to argue with these commentaries too much. Um, when you start getting more proficient at Greek, you might get to a place where you could say, you know what, God bless this guy, but I really disagree with him because of this, this and that. But you don't want to start doing that in your first few weeks of Greek. Um, so be very careful about that. Normally you're going to find it agrees with the commentaries uh, and it helps you to say it with faith rather than just thinking, well, Adam Clark said this, therefore I'm going to agree with him because hopefully he's right. Um, so you check a commentary, but you do this last, okay? You do the grunt work, and then you check a commentary later. And the commentary I'm going to suggest for what you guys are doing is free with eSword. It's called Robertson's Word Pictures, RWP. And uh, th that's the commentary I'd suggest because he mainly just looks at the Greek and explains what the words mean. Now, we're now going to look at common mistakes in word studies, okay? Common mistakes, and you'll be familiar with these. One of them is called anachronism. Anyone know what anachronism is? That's, that's the next one. Oh. Uh, uh, that's, uh, what it is, it's defining a Greek word by an English word that is derived from its meaning. Okay, It's defining a Greek word by an English word that is derived from its meaning. Now, if you're normal human beings, you're going to be like, yeah, thanks, don't, uh, that don't mean nothing to me. Okay, so let me give you an example. When people were preaching and they say, now, in the Greek it says dunamis, which is where we get our word dynamite. God's power is like dynamite. It will blow rocks apart. <laughs> dynamite. When you're praying, remember, you've got this dynamite inside you. Okay, this is an anachronism, okay? Now, it's a mistake. You don't want to do it, okay? Basically, it's backwards. It's backwards and it's wrong. Language doesn't work this way. How many of you know that Koine Greek was spoken long before the English language even existed? Okay, right. So you can't look at what a New Testament writer wrote and then say, how is an English word derived from that? And then try and get its meaning from the English word because English words change their meaning over periods of time. There might have been a good reason for why originally they chose the word dynamite. It might have been like, well, dunamis means power and somebody got it. But it doesn't mean that today, now in 2006, you can assume that our English word that's derived from a Greek word means the same thing. It's completely backwards and it's the opposite to what we're learning Greek for. Okay, so, so be very careful with that. Um, and notice that God's power is never mentioned in Scripture as blowing rocks apart. <laughs> okay, so, so there's a whole theological issue with, with doing this thing. So that's anachronism. Right, next mistake, etymology. etymology. Etymology, right, is where you look at how a word was originally created. Okay, um, now this, hope I don't annoy people, this is very popular in Vine's expository dictionary. And if you've watched the CD-ROM I gave you from Bill Mounts, uh, you find out that no Greek teachers, well, there might be one or two out there, but the general consensus amongst all the guys I've listened to and read their books, no Greek teachers recommend vines. Um, so sorry if you've got it and you really want to use it. Um, I used to use it, and uh, I've actually got some mistakes I've made in preaching uh, because of tools I've used. If you want to get your car fixed, you want to use good tools. If you want to build a house, you want to use good tools. If we're going to preach correctly, we want to use good tools. So... Vines is very popular at doing this. Here's an example, the word repent, metanoe. Now you've all heard me preach this before. Meta means change and noe means mind. To repent is to change your mind. It doesn't, okay? Uh, something to bear in mind is theological concepts are much broader than the meaning of one word. When we look at the word repent in a biblical concept in the, in the Bible and we try and see where is repent used, we don't see it anywhere being someone changing their mind. And unfortunately, a bad theology has come out of this where some people teach, using this technique that you'll find in Vines, they actually teach repentance is changing your mind, but it's not an outward action. Now, a lot of people who teach, like when I've taught this before, saying it means change your mind, I've said you're changing your mind about yourself, about your sin, and about your saviour. 
And as a result of that, you're turning yourself around, um, which is safe to say. But really, we're going down a red herring when we use this change of mind thing, because that, that's just not the way it works. To give you an example, um, butterfly. What's a butterfly? It's a fly that is made from butter and it flies around. Uh, that's what a butterfly is, right? I mean, butter and fly, it must mean that. That's etymology. The, uh, the other one is pineapple. Uh, we all know that a pineapple is an apple that you pick from a pine tree because you've got the word pine from pine tree and the word apple from the fruit apple. So you see, it, it doesn't work. Sometimes it might work. So I'm not saying that it never works, but I'm saying be very careful. This is why I stopped using vines, because I, I didn't want to say stuff that then later I hear some evangelical Greek scholar saying, this is not what it means. And then I'm like, oh, man, all those people, I told them that's what it means. So it's recommended you don't use vines. Um, and just be careful from doing it. So you can buy books on etymology, and it's very fun and exciting, but you've got to be very careful about it. Now, another common mistake is classical Greek usage. When people, people say, this is what the word meant in classical Greek. Now, you've probably heard people say this with a word for apostasy. People say, well, in classical Greek, the word apostasy has been, has been used to say the word departure. And then they say the great apostasy is a rapture. It's people being raptured. Now, here's the thing. Classical Greek was hundreds of years before Koine Greek. Koine Greek happened because you had classical Greek and then you had uh, Alexander the Great taking over most of the world and then he made everyone speak Greek. So you imagine all these different people groups start speaking Greek, it's going to lose a lot of the subtleties of, of Greek, of cla classical Greek. And then you've got Koine Greek because a lot of the nuances in Greek were lost, a lot of the grammar was lost because people were speaking a more common Greek. A bit like in London today, you've got Pidgin English. So it would be a, a similar kind of thing with foreign people try and learn English. They don't learn it so precisely, you get pidgin English. So that, that's how Koine Greek came about. You can't then look at how a word was used 300 years before and say, aha, it meant departure. So therefore, I am going to say it means departure. What you've got to do instead is see what does it say in the New Testament? How is it used in the New Testament? So the meaning of a word a few hundred years before the New Testament does not necessarily have the same meaning in the New Testament. Sometimes it does, but quite often it doesn't. Now, I've got a classical Greek dictionary over there, and you can have a look at it later. It can be useful to see how a word is developed, how Christians have taken words like blessed, and how it's changed its meaning in the New Testament. It can be interesting for that. I mainly find it interesting to just check when guys say, now in a classical Greek it means this, blah, blah, blah. So I look it up in a classical Greek, then I look it up in the New Testament Greek dictionary, and then I'm like, hmm, doesn't really work, mate. So... That's, that's one of the common mistakes. Now, another one is thinking that words on their own give the meaning. Because rarely do we communicate with words only. Normally, our words are linked with phrases and sentences and paragraphs. And this is really important because I've actually done this. And on this Sunday, I've got to reteach a few minutes of a sermon I taught a few weeks ago where I just looked at the meaning of a word in the text, and I was kind of sloppy. I didn't really look at the Greek too tough. I just picked out one word, looked at the meaning, said, this means this, blah, blah, blah. Now the word does mean that, but I missed out a grammatical construction before it, which didn't change the meaning of the word, but completely changed the way the word's used. And those of you in church on Sunday, you're going to find out. And so that was me thinking, yeah, we just communicate with words. Instead of thinking, actually, there's phrases that words are part of. So when you do a word search, you've got to be really careful. You don't just say, this word means this, therefore I'm going to use it in such and such a way. You've got to look at the phrases it's used in and the grammar. And that's why next week we're going to be looking at a bit of grammar. And like I said a minute ago, theological concepts are bigger than words. When you're looking up the word repentance, you then look and see how it's used in the Bible. What did the people in Nineveh do when they repented? What have people done in the New Testament when they've repented? So another common mistake, not looking at the author's writing style. I'm talking about like not looking at Paul's writing style or Matthew's writing style or John's writing style. Here's an example. John, in the Gospel of John, he uses a lot of synonyms interchangeably. What I mean by that is he uses words like the word for see in Greek. There's two different words that he often uses interchangeably. Now, he does it with love as well. Remember I was telling you earlier about agape and phileo? 
Sometimes you see him use the word agape, next time you see him use phileo. You look at it in the context and you're like, he's not making a difference in this context here. Doesn't mean he's not always making a difference, okay? Don't read more into what I'm saying than I am, but you just need to bear this in mind. So you don't just pick out a word and say, aha, it means what I want it to mean. You, you find out, and you can do that reading in the commentary, you can find out about the way authors use certain words. So we don't want to just be like, I want this instance here, agape, to mean what I want it to mean so it's good for my sermon. We, it's better to really see what is God trying to tell us here. Um, and that's that, really, this last point. Just picking out the definition you want it to mean. It's very tempting to do that. We've got to be careful about doing that. So those are the common mistakes. And now we are going to do it. So take a hand out and pass it on. Yeah. You see, like the, the author's writing style um, mm. in the changing use of words in Johnny's <laughs> Yeah. How, you know, when you kind of have the whole issue of the, the word is in error and it's original man. Yeah. How do you, how, how are you able to, is there, is there a, like a policy or a principle that you can apply to knowing that that wasn't how the Holy Spirit inspired him to say it? Yeah, with hermeneutics, which we're not going to cover um, on this course, but one, one of the things you look at is what language was Jesus speaking most of the time when he's chatting to Aramaic? Yeah? Some argue that it was Hebrew. Hebrew and Aramaic, they're very close to one another. Um, one of the things you could do is when you're looking at the Greek, you could do some research and see, are these two different words used in Aramaic? Because then you get to see, is the gospel writer just changing words for stylistic purposes, like a, a great number of scholars, in fact, the majority, it's only a modern thing where people started saying that when Peter's reinstated that Jesus is saying phileo deliberately and then agape, a lot of scholars would say that in the language Jesus spoke, there weren't two words he could use. So, and when you look at the Aramaic translation, the versions of, uh, when you look at manuscripts, they just have one word. So, so they would say, Jesus used one word saying, do you love me? And John, as a writer, changed it for stylistic differences. Now, even if you don't agree with that, uh, you will still find other instances in the Gospel of John where John blatantly does that, where so that he doesn't keep repeating the same verb, he changed the verb. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, writing lyrics, yeah. Now, now, check it out. Something that's important to remember is when Matthew and when Mark are telling us what Jesus said, they're translating what Jesus said into Greek. Uh, you often hear people dis paraphrases. Um, notice that sometimes you find Mark translates Jesus saying, blessed are the poor. Matthew translates him saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Someone's doing a paraphrase. Someone's doing a word for word translation. You know, stuff like that is interesting because then you see like with our idea of inspiration, it's like we do believe Matthew was inspired when he wrote down what he wrote, but we need to understand he was inspired to write a translation of what Jesus said. Otherwise, he would have written in Aramaic. So, and there isn't a problem with that. There's no problem in our idea of inerrancy. It is inerrant and it is inspired. But for some reason, God chose to let Matthew do a bit of a paraphrase here, or maybe it was Mark who did a paraphrase. Um, so it's just important to know that Jesus wasn't speaking in Koine Greek. Um, most of these situations, we're seeing the gospel writers translate them, and that helps when you're, when you're studying it. Um, when you first hear that, it sounds a bit weird, like, well, is this some dodgy thing? But spend some time mulling over it, and you see it doesn't affect your, your view. Of, well, it could affect your view of inspiration, but it's not a, uh, a dodgy doctrinal thing. It's just something that people don't often think about a lot. And on the CD-ROM you're getting later today, you've got a video from Dan Brown. Sorry, not Dan Brown. <laughs> <laughs> From Dan Wallace, who's one of the leading uh, manuscript authorities in the world. And he, he's actually just written a book. He's written a book countering the Da Vinci Code. And because this guy's like the man, the Don, it'll be very interesting to read it. And he says that when he goes to the scholars' seminars, um, you know, majority of scholars are um, liberals, right? And he says most of them, almost all of them, used to be evangelical Christians but they were given simplistic answers by people on the right, if you, if you know what I mean, like right-wing Christians, who just said, oh, don't worry about these so-called contradictions or whatever, it's just blah, blah, blah. Gave them a real simple answer. 
Then when these guys go off and chat to people on the left, like when they go to seminary, then they get given some real answers, not true answers, but suddenly they're like, my whole faith is shaken. These guys, my pastor, they lied to me and they become a liberal Christian. So I think it's important for us to be academic in our approach to the Bible. When we see stuff like, oh, hang on a minute, Jesus really spoke in Aramaic. These are translations of what Jesus spoke. To, to realize that that's something to think about rather than just say, oh no, that isn't true. Inspiration is just... They're writing down like that and God didn't use their writing styles or, or anything like that. It's something to think about. 